Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Congressman. I uh, wish we could be together here in person, but thank you so much for taking some time um, to be with us virtually. I don't know if you can see, but there's a there's a great room of people all here <laughs> who are really excited to hear from you, and they can see you on the big screen, of course, as well. So, um, you know, uh, Varun, thank you for those introductions. Uh, Previn and I just have a few questions that we would love to ask you to get your thoughts and share a little bit more about your perspective and experience um, as an AAPI in such a uh, high position of leadership in a really um, important time in our country. So the first uh, question that I have is about representation. Um, and I think everybody in this room knows a lot about how important representation is AAPI representation. You know, just personally thinking in the <coughs> pop culture world, uh, I think about things like Crazy Rich Asians, which deeply flawed in many ways, but you know, there was something very meaningful to me walking into a packed theater full of mostly white people to watch a movie that was, uh, you know, acted all by, by Asians. And I think about um, everything everywhere all at once, and I Turning Red is high on my list. And I know that these are things that when we see ourselves in the media, uh, it means so much to especially young people thinking about what they might become. So of course, this is not a, 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 a conference about pop culture, it's a conference about policy. So would love to hear you talk about um, what's this connection between representation, AAPI representation, and seeing the policy outcomes that we need. Uh, so thank you, Lala, for that question. Let me first thank Varun for your introduction and for your leadership. And I'm thrilled to be uh, at this uh, event and to have this event moderated by Lala and Previn. And thank you all for attending. So in terms of your question, I remember when I first ran for elected office, I was running for Torrance City Council. Uh, my consultant told me something I never forgot. He said, the only thing you never have to explain is that you're Asian American. So I don't explain it. Um, and I think uh, when I'm running for office, so I think a lot of candidates sort of get into the trap of saying essentially, you know, vote for me because I'm Asian or vote for me because I'm a woman or vote for me because, you know, I'm you know, Latino. When what the voters want to know is how are you going to help them? How are you going to move their families forward? How are you going to make their lives better? And now that doesn't mean that when you get in office, you don't work on issues uh, that are important to the Asian American community. So I'll give you an example. Uh, in my first term in office, I remember reading an article about Sherry Chen, who had been arrested by the FBI, accused of espionage-like charges. Her life was turned upside down. And then later, all charges were dropped. And so I thought that article was disturbing. I started to circulate a letter to Juan Justice to look into it. Before I could finish circulating that letter, I read another article about Professor she of Temple University, who had also been arrested by the FBI. He was also charged with espionage-like charges. And then after his life was turned upside down, all charges were dropped. And as we looked into this, uh, there were a number of cases where there would be defendants who were basically alleged to have been signed. And then later the charges would be dropped. And the only thing that was similar among these cases is the defendants look like you and me. They happen to be Asian American. Uh, so I worked with uh, the Congressional Asian President American Caucus and with civil rights groups, and we did press conferences, op-eds, press releases, we met with administration officials, and to their Obama administration's credit, then the then Attorney General did two things. She first of all uh, put in another layer of review in Washington, D.C. to mitigate these kinds of cases and make sure that uh, the case only went forward if they had solid evidence, and she ordered implicit bias training for all her law enforcement and, uh, and prosecutors and DOJ personnel. And to us, there was a recognition that they understood when they saw certain kinds of fact patterns, Asian Americans would be basically put to a higher level of, of suspicion. <clears throat> now, is it possible that, you know, a bunch of Irish American members of Congress would have done the same thing? Well, yeah, it's certainly possible, uh, but no one did, right? It took Asian American members of Congress to look at this issue and get pissed off uh, and then try to do something to fix it. Uh, so that is why representation matters. Thanks so much for that. 
Thanks, Congressman. Well, first of all, just want to ask on everyone's behalf how you're feeling. Hopefully, not not too bad with COVID. Uh, so um, I'm not taking ivermectin because I'm not a horse, uh, but I am taking <laughs> Paxlovid because I believe in science and I feel much better. I uh, feel much better today. So thank you for asking. <laughs> Glad to hear that you're feeling all right and also that you're not a horse. Both good things. Mm -hmm. um, so before uh, our session, we had a, a, a very impressive panel of uh, advocates talking about gun violence prevention. Uh, and specifically how that matters to the AAPI community and, and why it uh, matters to the community. And the stats are, are you know, as you know, uh, incredibly distressing uh, nationwide, you know, 49,000 deaths by gun violence, uh, uh, you know, over 600 mass shootings. Um, and, you know, the list of cities that we can name just gets longer and longer and longer. Uh, and obviously with Atlanta, and Indianapolis being kind of top of mind for a lot of AAPI uh, voters when they think about this issue. Um, you've been an outspoken advocate on, on gun control, uh, which is phenomenal. Um, it sometimes feels like there are so many doors that are closed and avenues that are foreclosed. I'm a trial lawyer, so I think a lot about this from the perspective of how we hold companies accountable. Uh, and given the precedent that's been set by the Supreme Court, the options are and given the, the uh, immunities that exist in federal law, the options there are narrower and narrower. Um, what do you think we can hope from out of a divided Congress on gun control legislation? Is there uh, hope to be had here? Uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Trevor, for that question. My view of politics is that everything seems impossible until it happens. Uh, so if a decade ago, I would have say to you, hey, in 10 years, we'd have gay marriage in 50 states and then a number of them would be smoking weed. I think I was crazy, right? <laughs> That's what we have now. And you never know when various issues uh, become law because of public opinion or something happens uh, that causes a chain of events that then leads to uh, a change in how society views certain issues. Uh, so in terms of gun reform, we did pass uh, a gun reform law this year. I wasn't, uh, what many of us wanted, but it was a step forward, right? It had significant amounts of money to go to crisis intervention programs. Uh, it increased um, scrutiny for 18, 21 year olds uh, who wanted to buy a gun. It put additional uh, laws against straw trafficking and uh, gun trafficking. It also closed a boyfriend loophole. Uh, it had a number of provisions uh, that uh, will help. Uh, now, uh, there are a lot more actions we can do and take. And my view is we just have to keep pushing and pushing and you never know when something happens uh, that will create an opportunity for uh, bills to become law. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. That's, um, and we're grateful that you're continuing to push the issue uh, as vocally as you are and, and we'll keep our fingers crossed that there'll be more, uh, more good news uh, coming out this coming term. Um, we did hear in the last panel from, uh, from someone with the NEA, uh, and obviously, uh, uh, you know, a lot of focus around school shootings and the prevention of future school shootings. So I was curious to, to hear you speak about how gun violence prevention is an education issue and how those two uh, can kind of intersect. So I happen to also know a lot about this because my better half, my wife, Betty, is a school board member uh, in, in the city of Torrance where we live. And the first time she ran, she ran on a platform that had uh, basically school safety and, and also uh, youth mental health as two of her top priorities. And those those sort of merge when it comes to gun shootings at, at schools in, in a number of cases. Uh, so I think it's important for schools to, <clears throat> first of all, have a plan in place for what to do if they were ever to have a... Um, incident where there is an alleged shooter on campus. I think it's important for the teachers and students and administrative officials to, to know uh, what to do and how to uh, ask for help and, and how to react. I think it's also important uh, to have uh, additional school counselors available uh, to help make sure that folks who um, may, may be troubled uh, or, or uh, given the opportunity to seek counseling. As many of you know, there highest rate of gun deaths actually comes from suicides. Uh, and so if we can 
um, make sure that people uh, get the housing they need before they have access to a gun that could also prevent unnecessary deaths. So there are a lot of things we, we could do. The gun reform law we passed this year does have a significant amount of funding to go to schools uh, to help uh, with the gun safety issues. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for those comments that really, uh, you know, I think they complement really well the conversation that we were having, having earlier with the panel on the subject. Uh, so I wanted to ask a couple questions on the topic of reproductive justice. And I'm, I'm actually your neighbor. I live in San Francisco in California. So thank you to both you and your wife to her, her service at the local level. Um, if, if everybody might indulge me just for a minute, I'll take the moderator's privilege to tell a personal story that I became a mother a little over a year ago. Uh, but when, I, when my daughter was about eight months old, I actually took her to her first protest. And it was the bands off our bodies protest in, um, in San Francisco. And, uh, you know, I was, of course, infuriated that we needed to be there at all, but also really proud to be there with her and marching alongside uh, many of the volunteers from the organization for my day job at Sister District. So as we were reaching the end of the march route, it was down Market Street and we were approaching the ferry building and I remember it very well. It was a beautiful day. You could see the bay glittering in the background. I saw a sign that stopped me in my tracks and it said, I marched with my mother. I never imagined I'd have to march with my daughter. And, you know, it, it really reminded me why I stay in this work and why we all need to stay, you know, working for the better world that we want to see. And, and it made me feel really grateful that I had the opportunity to choose to become a parent uh, the way and the times that I wanted to be. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that I live in, in California like you, and we have, we just passed Amendment 1, uh, you know, in the training. Um, in our state constitution, um, access to an abortion and making huge steps in reproductive justice. Uh, but of course, with the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs um, that that created a, a delta seismic blow um, to uh, taking away rights um, from all of us uh, in such a long time. So I'd love for you, uh, you know, I, I wanted to highlight also that I know that you've got a hundred percent rating from NARAL. Um, and so would that, that record doesn't come easily. I would love to hear from you about, uh, you know, why is abortion and protecting it so important to you and how have you been able to stay so true to that in your career? Well, because I believe in uh, freedom of conscience. Uh, I think it's uh, very important that on an issue as important uh, as whether or not to continue a pregnancy that that is made uh, by the woman in consultation with whoever she wants to consult with. Uh, whether it's her doctor uh, or her family uh, or her God or no God at all, um, but that decision should be made uh, by the uh, woman um, and government should not be injecting itself uh, into that extremely personal and intimate and life altering decision. So that's sort of where, where I come from. Uh, it also turns out uh, that the Asian American community largely supports uh, reproductive rights. If you actually look at uh, the DCCC, um, it spent over six figures on the Asian American community. And if you just look at the ads they ran, a number of them were solely focused uh, on the abortion issue. Uh, and that's because that's what the data showed. So it's, it's sort of interesting that the Asian American community, um, well, actually, it shouldn't be interesting at all. It's it, the Asian American community, as I've seen with as most communities, so they're pretty concerned about you know, reproductive rights. And so, um, it definitely was one of the main issues that the DCCC also uh, spent money on and specifically targeted among the Asian American community. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I remember uh, going to a DTRIP event shortly before the election, actually, and I think I saw one of the ads that you're talking about, and it was very, very striking. I found it quite powerful that it, it featured an Asian American couple and a family. and. 
I, I mean, it was heart wrenching. If anybody's curious about this ad, it was it's pre it's pretty serious, and I know that it's just one of of many. So it's wonderful to see that at this national level, um, there is attention being paid to Asian as a as a rising voting block. Um, and so that that's some of the opportunities. I'm curious, have you um, also uh, well, encountered any challenges in thinking about or talking about these issues with the API community, your constituents? Not from the Asian American community. Uh, I also uh, have a amazing district. I am a Democrat in a blue Democratic district. So my district largely also supports um, reproductive justice. <coughs> So it's it's not an issue that I get a lot of pushback among my constituents. I do know that not all districts are the same. And so we do have some purple districts where the members have to talk about it uh, somewhat uh, differently. But overall, even in purple districts, people are very concerned about making sure the government doesn't intrude into their bedrooms and into these very private decisions. And with the midterms, what you saw is Democrats overperformed. One reason is because uh, of the reproductive justice issues. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for sharing that. I'll turn it over to Brett. Yeah, and I'm I'm sorry to bounce around, but you touched on so many so many issues in your work, and and there are you know uh, quite a few that are of such so top of mind for for our community. Um, so there's one more that we really want to get your thoughts on, and that's um, diversity in education. So you know, obviously we had oral arguments in the student, students for fair admissions cases before the Supreme Court, uh, you know, quite recently. And uh, with the 6-3 court, uh, I don't have a lot of personal optimism that those cases are gonna, gonna uh, go the way of upholding precedent and upholding um, uh, universities' rights to, right to kind of consider diversity as a factor in, um, in creating a, inclusive student body. Um, and we had folks like Justice Thomas saying he doesn't have a clue what the word diversity means. Um, just kind of alarming, alarming developments like that. Um, but what part of what's interesting about those cases is the um, is how API's have been utilized by uh, the right wing to kind of advance their agenda. And, and there is a kind of case to be made on both sides, right? There's decent evidence that Harvard was in fact discriminating against Asian Americans, at least you could read the record that way. Um, it, it, consistently, Asian Americans scored lowest in terms of likability uh, because of perceived personality traits, or I guess you could call them perceived personality defects, according to Harvard's admissions officers. So I'm curious to get your take on how um, you talk to AAPI voters about affirmative action and diversity in education, when on the one hand, you know, it should be a value that's so kind of fundamental to so many of us. And on the other hand, how um, a lot of us have experienced discrimination uh, in terms of gaining access to higher education and to the upper echelons of, uh, of society. So that's a humongous question. And, and you can take that in whatever direction you want to go, but that's the topic. Sure. I support diversity in education. I do. I think it's important that you call it what it is, which is diversity in education, because I think what the college would say is they're not engaging in affirmative action. They're not, for example, trying to rectify uh, slavery and, and the effects of that from 200 some years ago. That, that's not what they would say they're doing. What they're trying to do is to create a incoming freshman class that's more diverse and interesting because you do have someone who is great, great, grandfather was a slave uh, and you have someone who is you know Cambodian American and someone who is uh, Italian American and someone who is a great trumpet player and someone who is you know the world's greatest ballet dancer or whatever so they're trying to create an interesting diverse incoming freshman class and it's very interesting that when Justice Thomas says he doesn't know what diversity is that would be exactly the reason why the Supreme Court should actually step out of this and let college admissions officers decide what diversity is, right? You let the college admission uh, office and the college build the diverse class that they want. And if you know a college thinks it's important that they uh, have uh, someone who is you know really really good at playing the clarinet, well, fine. That college gets to do that and gets to accept that person, give that person bonus points because they're really really good at playing the clarinet. Um, and I think 
uh, it's important that colleges have this freedom to build a diverse class. Uh, so that's a different issue than, you know, did Harvard execute um, their admissions process within the confines of the law? And so if they actively discriminated against, you know, Asian Americans and rated everybody as unlikable, you know, or whatever, then, you know, that would be a problem, right? So there's two different things going on, but I do support allowing colleges to use race as a factor in its admissions policies. Just to push you on that, how, how do you talk to the Asian American Pacific Islander voters about this though, when they are seeing the kind of interplay between these two things and there is a fear of getting discriminated against and universities using the admissions process and a race, race conscious or race aware admissions process just to discriminate against them, right? And that, that may lead some to think, well, we should just take race out of the equation altogether. Well, I, I think the way I would talk about it is it's not clear to me um, why SAT scores should be preference over diversity. Like, why? I mean, it's just, it's just that's just a choice. And I think a college gets to make a choice saying, well, no, we value diversity more than SAT scores. Deal with it basically, right? I mean, why do you get to tell a college what the college should determine what criteria to use in accepting students, right? I mean, I, I think a college should decide, well, yeah, you know, we think that SAT scores are sort of important, but you know what? We rather have a diverse class. And I think a college should be able to decide to do that. Right? There's, there's no reason, you know, why somehow race has to be treated differently than, you know, someone who's, you know, I don't know, a really good piano player, right? I mean, if you want to build a diverse class. I think college gets to build a diverse class. Well, and just following up on that, I, you know, we are kind of in the midst of obviously a huge culture war around public education, uh, not just at the university level, but at the secondary school, elementary school level. Um, the, you know, the fights over CRT and, and whether that ought to be part of uh, curricula uh, at the lower school level. Um, how, how do you think we can go about uh, uh, convincing white Americans that it is valuable to make public education more inclusive of, uh, of our histories? So I also happen to know more about this uh, because my wife has to be on the school board as well. No one is teaching CRT in K through 12 schools. It just isn't happening. Um, now, there are lots of teachers across America. Do individual teachers sometimes teach really conservative things or really liberal things or really weird things? Well, yeah, yes. Individual teachers sometimes will say things that, well, maybe they shouldn't have. But you look at these textbooks, you look at a curriculum, no one is teaching CRT in K through 12 schools. So it's just bunk. It's, it's just ridiculous what you know Fox News and Right Wing is saying. Now that is taught uh, at colleges and, and higher levels. And I think it's fine. I think it's a legitimate uh, inquiry. I think um, all of you in this room understand that, you know what, it is not the same living in America, uh, depending on what kind of skin color you have. Right? That actually does in fact uh, make a difference uh, in, in some cases. And hopefully one day it'll make a difference in no cases. But right now it, it does make a difference. And so I think CRT is a totally a legitimate inquiry, but it is not being taught in, in K through 12 schools. What the polling shows is what people respond to is they want facts being taught, taught to their kids. They want history and uh, they want, um, you know, English and math and the subjects being taught, but they do want facts being taught and parents are okay if these facts make their kids uncomfortable, right? They don't want uh, to sort of whitewash history, but I think the most effective thing is saying, we're gonna teach facts to our kids. And some of those facts may be uncomfortable, um, but those are facts and they should, they should know it. That's great. I love that framing. And we've been talking so much throughout the day about messaging and how to, what the right word choices almost could be to, to uh, penetrate through the public consciousness of some of these issues. And I, I love the, you know, we gotta teach facts framing. That, that's uh, really helpful. So and by the way, uh, a bunch of these facts, uh, are the history of people who happen to be Asian American, right? And so I think it's super cool, right, that Illinois went ahead and mandated uh, teaching of Asian American history and, you know, before they can graduate from high school. 
uh, I think four states, in fact, have done that now. Um, California's gonna try again, I believe this year. And New York has legislation to try to do that also. That's great. That's awesome. And shout out to, we have a Illinois state legislator in the room here, so, <laughs> or soon to be. Very cool. So we've got time for questions mm -hmm. from the uh, pretty august, incredible group of folks that's assembled here that you can't see. So I'll, I'll turn the monitor. If you have a hard time hearing anyone, uh, I can just repeat the question and we can we could do it that way. Anyone want to start? I can uh, break the ice if nobody else has any questions. This is this is Lala again. I've asked some question, some version of this question a couple times already, but um, you know, I'm very focused on state legislatures and that's a big focus for us here at the Victory Alliance as well. Um, and so uh, my, my question for you, of course, you are a Congressman and you work um, you know, at this federal level and trying to get different kinds of policies passed to advance our progressive agenda. But um, as you mentioned, your uh, wife works at the local level, the school board level. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how um, you know the role that uh, state policy can play and how it relates to federal policy in advancing our shared goals. Uh, so it, it does depend on the issue. Uh, so for example, uh, on the issue of crime, uh, those are larger decisions made at the state and local levels, what the federal government can do is provide a bunch of funding. Uh, and so the American Rescue Plan, uh, which was a party line vote, basically all Democrats supported it. It provided a huge amount of funding to uh, local cities and having served on the city council, I know that a very high proportion of city's budget goes to police and fire. It goes to fund police officers and, and firefighters. And so, Democrats, in fact, provide a lot of funding uh, for local officials uh, to do that, uh, especially during the pandemic uh, at a time when the economy was not doing well. Now, how local officials and state officials execute those policies, it's going to depend on, on different jurisdictions. Uh, there are other issues where the federal government uh, has a lot more of a um, sort of mandated approach. Uh, so. Um, for example, when it comes to, you know, the FCC or, or you know, communications issues and, and so on, um, when it comes to issues related to, uh, in my view, for example, encryption. So I, I have a bill that basically says, look, you can't have 50 states. They have 50 different encryption standards that Apple has to then have their phone deal with. That would be sort of impossible. So that should be a national standard and the states would have to follow that. So it really, I think, depends on the, on the issue. Yeah, thank you for the insight. It's useful to hear some of those examples as well. Um, yeah, please, I'm going to turn the monitor and hopefully that. Uh, hello, Congressman. Uh, my name is Jessica Shao. I have the opportunity to work with the Climate Justice Alliance on occasion. And I wanted to ask, um, what do you think are some of the possibilities of the Inflation Reduction Act, various buckets of funding, including the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund um, for Asian American communities across the United States and especially environmental justice communities? Thanks for all that. Were you able to hear that, Congressman? Could you repeat the question? Yeah, sure. Uh, so the question was from Jessica Chow with the Climate Justice Alliance. And her question was about the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, and whether greenhouse gas emission reduction um, allocated funding, uh, whether that's going to be going to AAPI communities. Did I sum that up fairly? Yeah, and what are some of the possibilities? Like, what are some ways that we could use that funding, and especially with environmental Right. And what, what are some of the ways that we can use that funding on in, in frontline EJ communities? Uh, uh, what are the sort of possibilities you envision for that money? Uh, so thank you, Jessica, for that question. So, yeah, so there are definitely set asides uh, for environmental justice. Um, a lot of how the funding goes out is, is through grants. Uh, and so I will have my staff look into it. We can get back to you on sort of specific pots of money that uh, perhaps folks within the Asian American community can apply to where they may have a higher chance of, of getting the funding. Um, I don't know offhand specifically 
uh, how every stream of funding gets allocated, but we will definitely, we can definitely cons uh, get in that, get all the information and, and get it to you. Thank you. And unfortunately, it looks like we only have time for maybe one more question. And I know your time is, is tight and valuable. Uh, plus our tech is starting to kind of fail us over here. So we'll take, take one more. Volunteer. Hi, Ted. How are you? <laughs> I'm great. Thank you. So um, I wish you were here and could have been here earlier just to listen to uh, the dialogue that happened. So one of the things that uh, came up is how to make sure that the AAPI voice is at the tables of power. And you've been at this for a long time. So what recommendations do you have? for us, because there's a lot of national AAPI groups that are doing great work, but still our voices are not heard. Uh, that, that's a great question. Uh, so I think we all just have to keep pushing. And uh, let me just, for example, talk a little bit about uh, the, the, the vice chair race for the House Democratic Caucus. It doesn't just happen, right? I mean, you need to have a lot of support and so, the Congressional Asian Preservation Caucus, for example, uh, went ahead and endorsed me early. They sent a letter out uh, to all their um, Democratic members. Judy Chu gave me nominating gave my nominating speech. Uh, members of KPAC would go ahead and whip other members for me. Um, and then we had the Congressional Hispanic Caucus come on board and endorse me as well. Uh, so um, some of this happens because you you, you build coalitions, but also just having groups work together. And so one reason I won the race is because of KPAC. Uh, and if KPAC you know, didn't exist, it would have been harder. Uh, and so now we have more organizations and we have a greater population, right? The Asian American Pacific Islander neighborhood Hawaiian population has more than doubled in size since 2000. And according to uh, Pew Research, they project Asian Americans to be the largest immigrant group by 2055. And the population is growing in places not only like California, New York, but also places like Georgia and Nevada. And uh, this weekend, uh, I was going to go, but I got COVID. But members of KBAC went to Georgia uh, to help Senator Warnock. Uh, and so part of it is sort of building coalitions, um, not just with, with, with House members, but also with bicameral bases with, with the Senate members. And uh, I think that's one way uh, to. Uh, amplify our, our voices at the table. But as our population increases, there's going to be more and more opportunities. And just having people run for office or run for different positions is, is very helpful. And so hopefully that continues to keep on going. And then having outside groups uh, help and individual members help um, and, and everything that, that everyone in this room is doing is also all very helpful. Great. Well, yeah, thank you so much for your time, Congressman. This has been really terrific. Um, and I'm sure we could, you know, ask you questions all day, uh, but we should let you get back to, uh, to hopefully a swift recovery from COVID and all the important work that you have to do for our communities. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks so much, Congressman. Thank you. So sorry for the sound issues. We were not imagining 